Great, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, I wanna introduce uh, tonight's um, uh, moderator, uh, Tina de Belgard. Uh, Tina's debut novel, Winter Witness, uh, the first in the uh, Batavia on Hudson mystery series, uh, was nominated for an Agatha Award for best first novel, uh, among other uh, several other awards. Uh, reviewers have dubbed Tina the Louise Penny of the Catskills. Uh, Dead Man's Leap, which was her uh, second book, uh, was recently released in April. Hopefully I'm getting all this right, Tina. Uh, Tina's uh, Storio, Tokyo Stranger, appears in the Mystery Writers of America anthology, When a Stranger Comes to Town. Her short stories also appear in the Best New England Crime Stories. And Tina also writes award flash fiction, which you can read on her website. She is, or recently was, the Vice President of the Upper Hudson Chapter of Sisters in Crime, and she is also a member of the Mystery Writers of America and Writers in Kyoto. Um, Tina lives in Catskill, New York, with her husband Dennis and their cat Shelby, where they tend to their beehives, harvest shiitake mushrooms, and cultivate their vegetable garden. And Tina travels to Japan regularly uh, to visit her son Alessandro. Um, and I guess I should have mentioned uh, that tonight's presentation, uh, tonight's program is entitled Amateur Sleuths in the World of Art and Artifacts. It's a panel of mystery writers. Uh, every work of art has a story and some of them are deadly. Travel the globe with five mystery authors and their amateur sleuths as they delve into the world of art and artifacts. So everyone, let's give a big virtual round of applause to our panel and uh, Tina, you can kick it off and take it away. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Robert. What a great introduction. My goodness. <laughs> I didn't realize you had such a biography for me, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. But I'm grateful to Robert, to Tewksbury Library for hosting us. Thank you to all the extra libraries, those 15 libraries in the system or outside the system who are helping promote us, who are giving us some play tonight. I'm very excited. We're really happy to be here. And the five of us have gotten together to tour our books because we've discovered that we share this fascination with art and artifacts and crime. And, you know, we decided that it would make a great panel. And we've been working together now for a while. And we have tons of they're, all the stories are very different. So you're gonna, I think you're going to enjoy this. And like Robert said, we like to remind our readers that every work of art has a story and some of them are deadly. Um, again, I'm going to remind you, I think Robert mentioned it. If you have questions, just add them into the chat or the Q&A function. We'll be checking later at the end of the program for questions. Um, and I think we're just, I'm going to get started. All right. Um, we're going, I'm going to start with an introduction uh, to M.A. Manin. All right, so Mary's over there with that pretty background. Um, Mary Monin's debut novel, Death in the Aegean, came out this spring from Level Best Books. Her short stories have appeared in the Anthony Award-winning anthology, Mystery Most Edible, also in Black Cat Mystery Magazine and Black Cat Weekly. An avocational archaeologist and Air Force veteran, Mary divides her time between writing, traveling, and hiking. So I'm going to let you tell you a little bit about her book, Death in the Aegean. Um, when a former archaeology student, Stephanie Adams, travels to Greece, she's suspected of murdering a wealthy bride who accused her deceased father of artifact theft. So Mary, your book's character blends archaeology, romance, and a museum heist, right, of a precious artifact. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came about to, to write it, what was, you know, your backstory. So Death in the Aegean takes place on the Greek islands of Santorini and Crete. I've always been fascinated in archaeology. So when my husband and I went to Santorini, uh, we made a point to visit the archaeological site of Akrotiri, which was a Minoan town buried in the ash from the eruption of, on Santorini in um, about 1628 BC. And it was very fascinating. And um, a lot of the buildings and streets have been excavated and they found a lot of household items, like a lot of um, pots of different types and um, loom weights, which is interesting. But to date, they've only found a single gold statue and that's of a small um, ibex, a type of goat. But on nearby Crete, which was also a center of Minoan culture, from the same time period, there have been snake goddess statues found, but they've been made of ceramic, faience, a type of ceramic. And so my mind went to what if, what if a gold snake goddess statue was found at Akrotiri? What kind of people would come see it? 
and uh, how would they interact with each other? And human nature being what it is, of course, someone would covet it. And Stephanie learns this the hard way uh, as when the Akrotiri snake goddess is stolen from the Fear Museum, she becomes tangled in a web of international intrigue, theft, and murder. And uh, as her, uh, as the handsome tourist German, the handsome German tourist, Tomas says, where greed leads, murder follows. Um, so that's a little bit about my story. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Connie Berry. Now, <clears throat> Connie Berry is an award-winning and best-selling author who writes the Kate Hamilton mystery series set in the UK and featuring an American antiques dealer with a gift for solving crimes. Connie was raised by antique dealers who instilled in her a passion for history, art, and foreign travel. She lives in Ohio with her husband and adorable dog, Emmy. Connie's latest book is The Shadow of Memory. As Kate Hamilton contemplates her future with Detective Inspector Tom Mallory, she's also helping her colleague, Eva Tweedy, organize an upcoming auction at a seaside village on the Suffolk coast. Netherfield Sanatorium, an abandoned Victorian insane asylum, is being converted into luxury townhouses. But when retired criminal inspector Will Parker is found dead, Kate discovers that the halls of the sanatorium housed much more than priceless art. So Connie, this is the fourth Kate Hamilton book. She's the one with the artistic sensitivities and the knack of finding herself in the middle of murder. Why did you choose an antiques dealer for your protagonist? Uh, well, first of all, thank you to Robert and the Tewksbury system and all of us who are here tonight. It's so much fun to talk about this. And the reason that I chose an antiques dealer was because that is the world that I know. That is the world that I grew up in. My parents were high-end antiques dealers. This was an avocation for them that became a little side business. My father was um, an engineer and an inventor, but uh, he grew up on the Rockefeller summer home estate in Lakewood, New Jersey. Uh, he was raised by his, his Scottish grandparents. And so he had, um, because they were caretakers, he had access to this big mansion um, and the Rockefellers weren't there all that much. They, they were there in the summer. Um, so he roamed around this big house and they had a room that was dedicated to Chinese art and antiquities. And as a small boy, my father became fascinated with Asian art and um, he, he never lost that. And he passed that along to me. So this is the world that I knew, the world that I grew up in. My, my mother um, was a researcher. She loved to look into the history of objects and to determine as much information as she possibly could about the objects and where who had owned them and what their history was. And so I just came into this naturally. I, I love thinking about history and the past and how it impacts today. And I now am going to introduce to you Nina Waxman. Nina is, uh, she, she runs a digital marketing company and she studied illustration with Maurice Sendak, if you can believe it, at the Parsons School of Design. She has a passion for the magical city of Venice where her novel of historical suspense, The Gallery of Beauties is set. It's just been published by Level Best Books. And I think if I'm not wrong, um, Nina, you can tell us maybe later, I, th I think that your family history goes back to Venice yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, so I wanna tell you a little bit about the Gallery of Beauties. It's Venice 1612 a golden age for women of talent, beauty, and ambition. Two very different women, a notorious courtesan and a rabbi's daughter are brought together by an artist who chooses them as subjects for a gallery of beauties, portraits of the most beautiful women of Venice. And so my question, Nina, for you is, what is it about the artist and the portrait that motivated your heroine to leave 
the ghetto, which would have been a dangerous thing to do, and also something that a woman in her position would never ordinarily do. Yes, thanks, um, Connie, for the introduction. So I am very drawn to Venice. I'm obsessed with Venice, you could say, and my family does come from Venice. And what's interesting is my family is also a rabbinic family. So my ancestor was the chief rabbi of Venice at the time that my novel takes place. And, uh, and I am a descendant of lots of rabbis. So I know the conflicts and I know what goes on in those closed communities. The ghetto of Venice was the first ghetto ever. So it was the first ghetto ever created. And that's where we got the term was from Venice. And it was created for Jews at that time as a protective place. So it was walled and Jews were put in there as a way to keep them protected because everybody went to Venice in it originally because of the um, the attacking Visigoths and Huns who came through and Venice was all island. So it was a little bit protective for everybody there. So the ghetto of Venice itself is an island and they had gates that I said would, would be locked up. But they, and there were some rules and regulations about Jews leaving the ghetto. They weren't allowed to leave the ghetto at night and one thing. And so leaving the ghetto, they would close the gates. And if you wanted to leave, if you were found outside the gates at certain points in time, you could be fined or you could be imprisoned. So it was very dangerous. But on the other hand, the, the, um, that time period in Venice was very unusual for women. So women had a lot more freedom than they usually had. So there were women glass blowers, there were women artists. At the time, there was also a woman prodigy who happened to have been the first woman ever to receive a PhD from a university. So there was a little bit flexibility with women doing things. So as a woman, she had intellectual curiosity and she was already a scholar. Her father had let her study her husband and she's a Talmudic scholar. But the one thing she couldn't find anything out about in the ghetto was about art because there were no Jews who were artists. There were Jews who were scribes, but they were not artists because Jews weren't allowed to join guilds where they could become artists and become pro, uh, you know, apprentices to artists. They weren't allowed to join the academy to learn art. So it was a huge mystery to her. And then a woman for an intellectual curiosity was dying to find out more about it. And that intellectual curiosity, as well as being confined both physically and mentally almost to this area that's a walled in area just made her have this is an opportunity she was presented to go out of this and how could she possibly pass that up so it overcame all those fears of the fines and going out at night and things like that because of that 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 short opening to opportunity to get out of the ghetto so that's a little bit about me and now i get to introduce the lady at the end with the beautiful picture of the Lou in behind her um, and the reason she has a picture for Lou is that she's the author of a new book called The Collector. And she's a baby boomer, in case you can't tell. And she's also <laughs> writes another series under another name. She's very versatile. Cordy Abbott is her other name. And she writes the Old Town Antique Mystery Series. Um, and Dead Men Don't Decorate is her first in that series, which is coming out in November of 22. She lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and also in Lewis, Delaware. And her book, The Collector, which the reason why you see that background behind her, is the first installment in Lane's art trilogy, art thriller trilogy called The Big Picture. And in her, in this book, her main character, Emma, Emma Kelly, to her, life looks like a masterpiece, but she's keeping a very big secret. She has two husbands. So that's uh, the kicker in her series. And so the interesting thing about Lane is she's been, her book has been described as Dan Brown meets a female James Bond in the art world. So whatever Lane Stone, who lives in Delaware and in, um, and in Massachusetts, tell us how, how you could possibly um, think of a woman who has husbands in two locations. I don't know how I thought of that. It just kind of came to me one day when I was writing this, but I've written several traditional mystery series, 
uh, where you have the amateur sleuth and you have the violence taking place off stage and you have it in a small town usually. I've written several of those and um, and my other series is, is a traditional mystery. So I will behave again then. Uh, but I was just in the mood to write like the most outrageous heroine I could think of. And I wanted to see if people would still like her um, even though she's, um, she has made a life choice most of us wouldn't make. Um, and I, I, I fail to thank Robert, but Robert, thanks so much for, um, for hosting us. I am going to uh, talk about uh, Tina de Bellegarde. And Robert introduced her in the beginning, but I've read her, her books, and so I can add on to that. <laughs> Um, he, he said that she's been called the Louise Penny of the Catskills. Well, that's because she's a great writer and she lives in the Catskills. Uh, as he said, with her husband and their cat, they tend bees and they harvest shiitake mushrooms. Her uh, books are the Batavia on Hudson Mysteries, uh, her award-winning series. Uh, the last book out was Dead Man's Leap. When a storm forces the villagers of Batavia on Hudson to seek shelter, the river rises and so do tempers. The flood washes up, up a corpse and a priceless Japanese artifact. And Bianca St. Dennis, I love that name, uh, finds herself teaming up with the sheriff once again to solve the, mur the murder. Tina, in general, the series isn't set uh, around uh, artifacts. Um, and how did you choose this artifact and why did you decide to incorporate it into Dead Man's Leap? Well, Lane, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's true. I, I don't usually write um, as your books tend to be around the artifacts and the art dealers. You know, my books are traditional mysteries. Some people call them cozies um, and they take place in the Hudson Valley. So this is kind of new, but um, I decided to insert um, an artifact because this this particular book is centers around Leonard Marshall, who's a former antiques dealer. And um, he used to work in a, an important auction house, but he left that to try to reinvent his life in this quiet little town in Batavia and Hudson. And he left that all behind because there was something shady in his background and he was hoping to, you know, to start fresh. And um in fact, there are a lot of characters in this book who are keeping secrets and um, trying to move beyond them. But as far as what artifact I was going to choose, um, it could have been anything because Leonard Marshall has this background in antiques, but I decided to make it a Japanese artifact. And it's a carved netsuke. Um, and netsukes are usually made of wood or ivory. Um, this one is... Um, uh, made after the image of Ebisu. He's one of the gods of good fortune. He carries a large carp and a fishing rod, and he is the protector of fishermen, which also ties into my story uh, because there is a fishing tournament and there's a storm and a flooding. So it kind of goes in there. But Netskis are decorative um, and they're also useful. And they have, um, I have one here. I don't know. Can you see it? It's so hard with these virtual backgrounds there. It's a turtle. This is one Netsuke. And they have these holes in the back and there they are. Um, and those are used and that's why they're useful. They're used to tie the obi sash around the tr Japanese traditional kimono for a man. And they, um, and they're used, they, they tie through those holes and then they either, um, and they're, they're used as a counterweight to things that they need to dangle on their um, OB sash. So it could be decorative. It could be useful, like a tobacco pouch or something like that. Um, anyway, I decided to choose Japanese. So I thought it could connect to my series better, right? My main character has a son who lives in Japan, like I do. And um, there's another character, Mr. Ishikawa, who's also from Japan. So there are two connections. And in the third book, I plan on sending Bianca to Japan. I always planned on sending her to Japan in book three. So Book two is sort of setting that up and um, it's a follow up. It sort of completes the story from book two um, because this Netsuke is a missing piece to a collection. So I won't tell you more than that, um, but that's why I chose a particular type of artifact. It could have been anything, um, but my, my, my passion is Japanese culture. And so I'm hoping to get back there this fall. We'll see. So thank you, Lane, for that question. Um, what I'd like to do now is get to some general art questions for the authors on the panel. Um, you know, 
we want to talk about why why do we write about art? Why do we find it a rich area to build a story around? Um, you know, for me, art captures the imagination, the history and the uniqueness of, of these items. The collectability is really what drives my interest. And in general, greed is a motive for these mysteries and thrillers. But artifacts sort of kind of tweak it a little bit. They have even more value. They're irreplaceable. And that aspect that feeds on that greed is sort of like greed on steroids, right? And centering a story on an artifact seems like a natural thing to do for a mystery or a thriller. Um, so what about you, Mary? Do you have, you know, what's, what's your thinking on this? Well, I... Um... Growing up uh, a military brat in Germany, I spent a lot of uh, school field trips and tours with my parents going to a lot of old churches full, full of, you know, hundred year old um, artwork inside them, castles and museums. And so I, I learned to appreciate art and uh, artifacts at a pretty young age. And I have to admit that, like you said, it, they just spark my imagination. They're, they're seem to be a bit richer than it you know it's more than just money it's it's the interest in the object absolutely connie why don't you give us here yeah I, you know i i mentioned before that that this is the world that i grew up in and one of the things that i would do with my parents would be go to antique shows where different antique dealers would have booths and the interesting part of that was that they all talked and there were so many fascinating stories about mm -hmm. dealers and people they bought from and who they sold to and what objects were really worth and who had this object and that and there was a lot of intrigue always connected with that and so and, and a lot of gossip so i kind of um love that part of it but um the 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 other part of it is that Antiques and, and artifacts, especially ancient things, they have to do with history, which is one of my passions, the past. And so an object of the past is a little bit like a time traveler. It, it, it was made in the past and used in the past, but it has survived into the present. And every object does have a history. And the this history in my books has an impact on the present and that is really true for all of us i think we we don't just live in the present we are sitting on on the top layer of a very rich full history and even if we don't recognize it what we do how we think how we feel is in part determined by the past either um, it, making that part of our life or even reacting against that. And so that really is kind of the, the interest in my books, the history, the past, and how that impacts the present. That's fascinating perspective. Thank you. Nina, why don't you um, add to that? Oh, you're muted, I think. Um, I think that you're hearing from everybody is there's a passion. Mm. So I think art really arouses passion in people. And all of us have been talking before about as mystery writers, you can almost attribute some of the seven deadly sins mm -hmm. to being instigated by art. You know, we talked about greed, but there is also lust and pride. Um, and for me, the portrait gallery, this gallery of beauties was something that really did exist and was an example of lust and pride. Um, there was a gallery of beauties that I saw in Munich in the palace of Ludwig I, otherwise known as Mad King Ludwig, where he commissioned the portraits of the most beautiful women of, of Munich to hang in his palace as a matter of pride to show how, you know, Munich, Bavaria, the Bavarian kingdom had such beautiful women and they had such nobility of beauty. And then I went to Hampton Court Palace and a lot of people don't know that and I didn't know until I was sensitized to the fact that noblemen like and kings made these galleries of beauties. There are two galleries of beauties in Hampton Court Palace. And one was done by William of Orange who came and um, been king after James I. And after his wife died, he had the portraits of all the noblewomen from the court painted in his like man cave 
Um, and it was a place he went for solace. And he thought looking at portraits of beautiful women also was a source of pride for his kingdom. And it gave him some, it soothed some of his sad thoughts. Whereas above him in an upper gallery, there's this huge um, entry hall that was the gallery of beauties for Charles II. And that gallery was known as the Windsor Beauties and they were basically portraits of his mistresses. So more in the um, realm of like Playboy centerfolds were his <laughs> portrait gallery. So that was really more for lust. So as you can see, and, in, and I realized for me, you know, the portraits are, were throughout history, you know, as, as Connie touched on, portraits were a real matter of history. If you think about, I, I went to art school, if you studied La Lasquez, he was the portrait painter. Every court had a portrait painter. He painted the portraits of all the nobility of court. Almost every king had their own designated portrait painter. And that, again, was for their pride. It was, um, and then nowadays there was um, one of the popes has a very famous portrait of himself and he, it's now, you can see it in the gallery, Pamphi, Dora, Doria Pamphili, where you see all these uh, incredible portraits that were amassed by people over the centuries as a matter of pride, and again, either lust or greed. So I think that for a mystery writer, art holds that beauty of it being able to arouse passions that might not, that might have been well buried before, but then you can kind of use it as an instigator to create the scenario that will lead to the murder. In, in my book, The Gallery of Beauties, what happens is the subjects of the portraits begin to be poisoned one by one. And so the courtesan and the rabbi's daughter must go together to try to find out who's poisoning these beautiful women. Fascinating. Lane, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about why you write about art. Well, I... Um, it, art, I'm so interested in art crime because art is important to people for, for different reasons. Um, and a lot of it gets back to the power of objects and the power of objects is real and the, the power they hold over us. Um, but uh, to, to uh, keep going with, with what Nina was saying about pride, the um, American wealthy families today, as well as you know, in the founding of the country, they were never going to have titles. They were never going to be made dukes or earls or anything like that. So how did they telegraph to the public that they were somebody, that they were cultured? Well, they would buy art, but almost immediately that wasn't enough. They had to become collectors. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, that just, when you see how people use art, you see a lot of ways that crime can, can um, be an offshoot of that. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Um, let's take a minute and talk about our research. Um, you know, what type of art research we did for our books or, um, you know, what was an interesting tidbit that we found, maybe something that made it into the book or didn't make it into the book. Um, you know, for me, my research is easy. I travel to Japan regularly. I have an extensive library of Japanese books with my son living there. Um, I have contacts I can consult, you know, even more knowledgeable than my son because people that he has contacts with. And of course, there's always the internet. So my, my research has been pretty straightforward. Um, and as far as a tidbit, a piece of interesting information, um, when I discovered is that when um, a, a Netsuke was commissioned, a statue statuette was commissioned, if it was commissioned from for someone significantly higher than the state, the artist station, like for nobility, then he did not necessarily sign it, right? That was um, like a show of humility. So I thought that was an interesting little tidbit and, um, and it actually did make it in, into my book. Um, I'm going to go back to Lane. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your research? Well, I have a postgraduate certification in antiquities, theft, and art crime, uh, but the research never ends, does it? You, you, you have to, to uh, stay up to date, and uh, one of the things I learned that I used in, in this first book was that uh, because the the protagonist is trying to stop a world war on art, someone is attacking masterpieces around the world, but usually when art is attacked in a museum, it's uh, a painting of a woman and the eyes or the breasts are attacked. A psychologist would have a, you know, we could work on that for years, right? Um, and and uh, so this was out of character. And so I, I use that. And then 
Of course, you know, just a few months ago, the Mona Lisa was attacked again, and it wasn't a very serious one. They they uh, they threw a, a pie <laughs> at, the, at it, but again, what is it? <laughs> So, so I, I uh, like I said, I started with my uh, postgraduate certification, and then I just keep researching. Very good. And Connie, can you give us a little insight into your research? Uh, yes, uh, the, the object in the shadow of memory that I'm that, that is kind of central is a 15th century painting by the Dutch master Jan van Eyck. Um, it's called um, Christ Healing the Demoniac from the Bible Story, and um, I, I, uh, whatever Kate has to know, I have to know. <laughs> so uh, the the problem with this painting is that it had, um, it it didn't have a uh, a very well documented provenance, meaning the history of ownership. It went back only so far, but not back to um, the 15th century, and so. Kate and her uh, colleague Ivor Tweedy have to figure out is is this really by Jan van Eyck? He he did not typically sign his paintings on the painting. There there are there's one notable exception for that. But so I had to do a lot of research into first of all how was a painting painted in the 15th century? Um, how did the Netherlandish paintings uh, painters do it? And I learned that they were the first. Jan van Eyck is usually credited with the first one. I don't think he really was. He was one of the first to use heat bodied linseed oil as a binder for the pigments, which was a great improvement because first of all, you could make a lot more of the pigment at one time so that, so that your colors were very um, uniform. Uh, and also um, just having to do with the luminosity of, of the paint. So I had to learn about that. And then I also, because um, it, because they were trying to figure out if this was really um, a, a genuine painting, I had to learn about how forgeries are made mm -hmm. and how people today or in like the last century could actually reproduce a painting that would appear to be a 15th century painting. And there are ways to do that. but. The most interesting tidbit that, that, that I learned was about the modern technology, spectrography um, especially, because it is actually true that much like uh, police use this, nobody can go into a crime scene and be there for any length of time and not leave something of themselves in that crime scene. No one can actually paint a painting without leaving something of the 21st century in that painting. So it could be a piece of dust, it, it could be um, a tiny fiber from a from a Orlan sweater. Um, and so that to me was absolutely fascinating and how today people detect art forgeries. And there have been some very famous ones. And I'm just gonna mention one, um, uh, Sotheby's gallery in London bought uh, a Franz Hals painting from a, a gallery and they sold it for $10 million to a collector in the United States. And by modern spectrography, it was determined to be a forgery and they had to, of course, pay the man back, but then they they had to, there was a long court case against this gallery. Did they know it was a forgery or or did they not? But but there's been a whole series of these forgeries and many of them were traced back to one single fabulous artist who could um, mimic the styles of many different uh, old masters. And and I, I just found that fascinating. That is fascinating. <laughs> Nina, I think you can add to that, am I right? Yeah, so I needed to go to artwork to learn more about what people looked like, what people dressed in the early 1600s. And I go to Venice a lot for my research. And in going to Venice, I always find a new gallery I've never seen. And I found this little foundation that had paintings that were from the 17th century. And in those paintings, lo and behold, there were a lot of paintings of Carnival. And um, I found in one of the paintings that there used to be a running of the bull across the Rialto Bridge in Venice to open Carnival. And I was like, whoa. And then there was another scene where it showed bullfights 
in um, the San Marco, Piazza San Marco. So here was something I'd never read about. I'd never found in any of my research. And I've been to Venice a million times. I never heard about. But in this little gallery, I found these paintings that were some artist who was capturing the opening scenes of Carnival. And, and I was able to find this very you know, interesting fact out. And then when I did look into it, and in the gallery, they had more information about it, I found they discontinued that practice because too many people complained about being gored by the bull, which is starting to kind of happen in Pamplona around, uh, around these days. But artwork was very, very important to me to get the understanding of what life, what dress was like, what the city was like. Because the other thing uh, about Venice, which I didn't know either, is when you go to Venice now, we all think of it as a city of water. But there are places you can walk, a, walk around in. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the older maps of Venice, you see that a lot of the places that we're walking out around now on were actually canals at one time that were filled in by Napoleon's troops who were very annoyed that they had to get into a boat to go almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. So Napoleon had a lot of these areas filled in. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Very interesting. Mary, give us a little tidbit. Yeah, that, that was fascinating. Um, well, I, my artifact is a gold statue, a Minoan gold statue. So it's like 3,600 years old. And so I did a lot of research on Minoan gold. And they, um, it's just amazing to me the uh, detail that they could do. They, they had beautiful, beautiful, um, delicate pieces made in gold. Bees, there's a famous bee pendant from Malia that um, it's just, it looks like it could have been made today. It was, it was just stunning. So I looked up, um, researched, you know, Minoan craft work, um, the gold work, and also basically Thera, uh, Santorini, and, and what it was like, um, uh, well, the effects of the eruption of the, that massive volcano. So that was fascinating. And the, um, the most interesting thing I discovered when I was there in Santorini on the tour is that um, at Akrotiri, no human remains have been found in Akrotiri. So there was a, an earthquake before the volcano and apparently the eruption, the volcano gave enough warning for all of the residents there to pack up, get in their boats, take their belongings, apparently all their gold belongings for sure. And they sailed away, hopefully to um, safety, but that was, quite fascinating to me. It's not like in Pompeii where they where you know we can see that people were caught. So so that kind of made me happy to know that they hopefully got away safely. Very interesting. That's great. Well thank you. Um, I think I'd I'd like us to turn to setting now. We have so many wonderful settings in these books. And you know everybody says that in certain books setting is a character in its own right. So why don't we discuss the role that setting plays in our novels? You know, why did we set our books where we did? Was there any particular, I know we talked about art research, but was there any kind of research for policing or crime solving um, that was particular to your, to your setting? So maybe Nina, do you want to talk to us a little bit about Venice and what role that plays for you? Well, obviously Venice is, is everything in the sure. book. Um, and, but I have to say that it's not just that it's the backdrop and talking about the canals. The other thing I wanted to capture about Venice, which I hope I've captured in my book, is there's a labyrinthine, sinister undercurrent that go, that's part of Venice. And if you think about all the other novels that are written about Venice, like Don't Look Now, for example, there's that feeling, that atmosphere of kind of darkness and you know, this unknown mystery, mystery kind of thing. And, and that's what I wanted to get to in the plot. So I wanted to make sure the plot felt as twisty as the way you can, you know, walking or getting lost in Venice could be. So I think it really even shaped the format of the novel as well. Oh, that's interesting. And, and Lane, you have a lot of places in your book. Why don't you give us an idea? I do. Um, um, and because it's a thriller, I needed a big playground. And she does travel all around the world to different museums. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun. But it meant I had to research um, Interpol, like what they do and what they don't do, in addition to researching uh, security departments in different museums. Um, mm -hmm. Blue, the Met. Yeah. 
Mary, why don't you? Uh, well, my character, Stephanie Adams, is in desperate need of an escape. And I thought Santorini and, and Crete, Greek islands are just the perfect place to escape. <laughs> so that's why I, I said it there. And I think what I'd like to come across and what I hope comes across in my um, books is the that intense heat and the sun and that crystal clear water, but also the ancientness of those um, those uh, Minoan palaces on Crete, it's Kenosis and quite a few others, but Kenosis is featured in mine and um, Akrotiri with its streets and its buildings and its sewers that are so modern and yet so very, very old. Yeah, it certainly does come across and it's a great, I don't know, they're all great armchair travel books. Connie, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your setting? Yeah, well, my setting is the UK. Um, my first book was set on a, an island in the Scottish Hebrides, and then it has since moved to a very small village in Suffolk, which is uh, an area of England, a county that is not very well known. It's not really on the tourist uh, track, um, but it is a very ancient part of England. Actually, Norfolk and Suffolk were uh, the, the Anglo, this part of the Anglo-Saxon culture, the North folk and the South folk. Um, but beyond that, there's, I, I, I am a complete and total Anglophile. I had Scottish grandparents. I went to school at St. Clair's College, Oxford when I was in college. Um, my husband and I traveled there a lot. Um, but there's something about an English village to me, it, it conjures up um, the rich history of the mysteries of the golden age for, for one thing, but beyond that, um, in England, there the cliche is that, you know, the English people love eccentrics, and that is really more than a cliche, it, it is really true. Um, there are just the most wonderful, wonderful characters uh, in England, and my character Ivor Tweedy is actually based on a, a little man who was in charge of a museum that we saw in a village. Um, and in terms of, of research, you know, traveling there, I you know, is, is absolutely essential. But I am very fortunate to have sources in the UK. So one of my main characters is a detective inspector in the Suffolk Constabulary. And, and I have a source, a detective inspector in the Suffolk Constabulary. Um, I also have a clergyman in the Church of England. I have someone in the coroner's office in Suffolk. I have um, a solicitor. So these people, when I get, you know, have a question, they, they are very, very generous to, to answer my question. That's terrific. You're very lucky. Um, you know, for me, setting is so important in, um, in a more general sense. Um, it definitely sets the mood for my books and my series. So like Dead Man's Leap, the book we're talking about this evening, is set in my fictitious village of Batavia and Hudson, which is basically in the Catskills or the Hudson Valley where I'm living. And um, but the next book in my series, Autumn Embers, will be taking place in Japan in, in Kyoto. And like I said, this general kind of um, feeling that, you know, the, the, the community-based aspect, right, whether it's that very intimate village in Batavia or if it's that expat community in Kyoto, mm -hmm. um, it's how these people interact, how they care for each other, maybe how um, it's idyllic on the surface, but it's not always, you know, what it appears. Um, also, um, my this book number two takes place in the Hudson Valley and there's cliff diving in the story. And that's something people do here. I don't know why they do it, but they do do it. And, um, you know, it takes place during a major storm and flooding. So it's kind of, um, it's actually kind of story that needs to, to happen here. Um, and then, like I said, the next story will be in Japan and I'm looking forward, I'm working on that book right now. And, and it's such a rich city in, in Kyoto. So, um, to me, it really has a lot to do with um, setting the mood. Um, 
we, I wanted to take a couple, I want to see if we can answer quickly, then we we'll want to some questions a little bit about our, our main characters and what drove those characters to get involved in these crimes and um, to investigate or how they kind of found themselves in that situation. My main character, Bianca, she's an amateur sleuth. Well, we're basically all amateur sleuths and she finds herself there through circumstance, right? She's not a professional in any way. Um, and so she's, but she's always at the right place at the right time, or as the sheriff would say, at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and she has good, you know, she has good skills. She's a historian, so she's very observant. She's an outsider, so she has, you know, fresh eyes on things. Um, and so, you know, my character sort of kind of stumbles on being an amateur sleuth, right? Um, in the second book, they're in an evacuation center, so it's tight quarters, so it's easy for her to get back involved. And she's a journalist and a writer, so it kind of puts her in there. And um, and because she has Japanese connections and this artifact is Japanese, she's helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So Connie, um, Kate is more uh, even more knowledgeable, right? So why don't you tell us a little bit about how she gets involved in in yeah, well, yes. Um, you know, I think that it, it has to be more than just being nosy, you know, and and curious. Um, and Kate is uh, an American antique dealer. She, like me, grew up in the high end antiques trade. So she has expertise. In fact, so far, she has been, actually been hired um, as a consultant by by the police twice because of her expertise. But more than that, um, she gets involved in these things because people she really cares about. She's come to really care about the people in this small village, my, my fictional village of Long Barston in Suffolk, and she has come to care about them. And in each of the books, one of those secondary characters kind of rises to the top and, um, and something happens and Kate is, um, wanting to help them to clear them of guilt of to um to use the knowledge that she has to play upon that and um her counterpart is detective inspector tom mallory so he is a policeman he is bound by police procedures he has to deal in evidence he has to deal in facts um, and yet Kate is not bound by any of those things. So she can speculate, she can draw conclusions, she can even think ahead. And um, fortunately, Tom has come to respect that about Kate. Yeah, we seem to have, our characters seem to have those things in common. Um, Mary, what about Stephanie? So Stephanie, um, she uh, was a, she did an internship in Crete long ago before she became a banker, but now, in the current day, she's been passed over for a promotion to vice president at the bank that she's been promised for three years. So she needs to get away. And she figures going back to um, Santorini and Crete to see this Akrotiri treasure exhibit is the perfect, perfect escape for her. And she has a tenuous connection to the uh, Akrotiri snake goddess. 40 years earlier, her father had discovered a seal stone with the image of that exact goddess and the uh, skyline of Akrotiri on it. Unfortunately, that marble steel stone was stolen. And it is that, that um, this wealthy bride on the ferry from Santorini to Crete accuses uh, Stephanie's father of stealing. Well, the bride ends up murdered the day after the Akrotiri snake goddess is stolen and the police uh, now have two high profile crimes to solve and both of them lead straight to Stephanie. So she does her best to clear her father's name and keep herself out of jail. And um, she just doesn't know who to trust because of course, not everyone is what they seem. Of course. <laughs> and Lane, what about Emma? She is a, um, she works at a, a fine arts insurance company as a title underwriter, fine arts title underwriter. And she's also an adjunct professor at NYU. And the, the police and the FBI need her expertise, but she is determined to get the answers before the FBI because she, in case it has something to do with her secret. And so everything she does is based on keeping her very big secret. Right. And Nina? <laughs> yeah, well, Diana, who's the rabbi's daughter, 
um, she is a Talmudic scholar. And one of the things that she is, is one of the current interests that had been going on at that time was uh, Kabbalistic thinking. And part of that Kabbalistic thinking was that there was a transference of souls. So there could be a temporary transference of one soul into another. And like many primitive people that you read about, like the Maasai who are afraid of getting their picture taken, she had this thought that maybe when her portrait is painted, because there's she marvels at the way the artist is able to capture so much of the likeness and the spirit of his subjects, that she thinks that maybe when he paints her, there will be that kind of transference of the soul that occurs between her and the artist. So aside from this you know, intellectual curiosity, she also has kind of this mystical thinking that maybe art will give her this incredible mystical experience that she's read about. And then of course, when she also is, her eyes are open to the whole art world and she gets out into Venetian society, it's just like a kid in the candy store and she's so interested in what's going on. And then she becomes swept up as, they, as she finds the first one of the subjects Poisoned, and she also has an expertise in medicines and herbal um, herbals. So she recognizes the poison, the signs of the poisoning. So that also a lot means that she's drawn into it because she understands poisons as well, which helps her become the amateur sleuth to help investigate who might be behind it. Okay. Well, very interesting. So we have a few questions. Um, I'm going to go to those questions and then we'll wrap up and we'll tell us what we'll tell everybody what we're doing before, you know, what we're moving on, working on now. So I have um, three questions. Uh, the first one is addressed to Nina. What was the painting on the cover of your book and who's the woman and how is it a part of the story? Well, the painting on the cover of the book is an authentic portrait of a woman from the 17th century, which is what I wanted to have. However, it is not a Venetian woman, it is an English woman. Um, so it is a portrait of somebody of that time. I wanted to make sure it was authentic, the look and the clothing. When I picked it, I have to say, my husband said, do not pick that picture, she's ugly. Um, <laughs> and I explained that our views of beauty are different today than they might've been at that time. But I wanted to capture, there are very few portraits. I do have, I have had seen some other portraits of some of the characters in the book. One of them is a famous woman poet who lived in the ghetto. Her name was Sarah Copio Sulam. However, that portrait I've only found as an etching. So it only existed in black and white. So mm. it's, you know, very hard to find a portrait of a woman of that time. And that's what I was looking for. But thank you for asking. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Teresa. That was a good question. Thanks. And then Eva, Ava Jane asked, um, with the exception of Ms. Waxman, are the books by the other four authors taking place in the present time frame? And yeah. I'd say generally that's the case, right, everyone? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Then, I, I would just add that, that mine do take place in the present time, but there is a, a big, big historical element in, in all of mine as well. Mm -hmm. I have somewhat of, you know, I, I, I look back a little bit too, and actually mine doesn't take place exactly in modern day, but in modern enough <laughs> and um someone asked on average how long does our research take i think that's a really hard question to answer um you know i think it depends for all of us what it is and plus there's that rabbit hole right um six you know, months <laughs> yeah exactly you could start looking for one simple piece of information and get so engrossed and so interested right yes um, i don't know somebody want to answer anything more specific to how long research takes i mean about six months is what i take i mean that's what i think that people who do deep research for the types of things you're doing are taking about half the time they need to write the book they're researching yeah well i, I you know i don't research it like in in advance i don't like do all the research and then, and then i write the book i i'm actually researching as i go along because i find something i go oh that's interesting you know i need to find out about that so i am constantly doing research and it it it's mm -hmm. a, it can be very very time consuming that's i was going to say the same thing because sometimes i'm in the middle of writing and then all of a sudden I want to write, like I was writing about um, my character walking down the street, walking down a, a, a street and smelling bakery goods. 
And then I started thinking, well, would she smell bakery goods? Did they have bakeries in those days? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you're, you're writing about a character eating dinner and you just have to think, oh, what would they eat for dinner? And all of a sudden you run to Google and you start researching what did people eat at this time period or in this place or what's the common food or something like that, because you want to get it right. And I've heard a lot of when you're writing, you know, contemporary mysteries, especially you want to make sure that if you're saying your character is driving down route X, there better be a good route X for your character to drive down. Yeah. James asked us a question about why we chose amateur sleuths um, like a Miss Marple rather than pros like Poirot or Daglish. I mean, um, anybody want to take that? Um, I, I, I'll just say. I, I have an ahead. opinion on it, which is to me, I always enjoyed reading about smart people, particularly smart women mm -hmm. who can see things with fresh eyes and you know come to conclusions without those constraints i think somebody talked about that right you don't have the same protocols um and plus you know it's police procedurals that's a whole talk about research right that's a whole nother oh, thing true. Yeah. right and nina you wanted to say something about this yeah i said you know in a historical one of the beauty the great things about writing historicals is you don't have to worry about forensics or any of those right kind of that's things. right mm. <laughs> this is so, everybody's an amateur sleuth they didn't have anybody who was really a professional sleuth if you write a historical perspective well there's but such a great history i'm sorry mary do you want to go ahead oh i was just going to say that um nina's diana does actually know a lot of she wow. does a bit of forensics herself with the botany yeah. And I was just going to say there's such a rich history of amateur sleuths in literature. And yeah. the reason there, there's a reason that they're so popular, and that is, you know, you have a you have a village and everything is fine, and then chaos comes to town in form of a murder. And the amateur sleuth symbolizes the power of one well-meaning person to put the chaos or the devil back behind the wall. Um, and so it is a, it's a, uh, it's something in literature that resonates with, with me, with most of us. And of course, the, the police procedural, that's the ability of, of society to put, or authority to put that devil back behind the wall. And then you've got a third, which is the private detective, which is that gray area. Mm -hmm. And I think we're we are right at eight o'clock. So I just want to add one more thing. And that is, I love police procedurals. But the kinds of books that I write, um, I can't have policemen talking the way I want to talk in, in my books. I, I don't want to uh, have the kind of language that I know is realistic. And I'm fine reading it. I just don't feel comfortable writing it. So, um, so that was just another little added reason. I love that. Um, so why don't we wrap up and tell everybody what we're doing? And um, while we're doing that, if we could answer Ro Rosamond's question, which is what's our favorite authors? You know, I guess if you want to name one or two of your favorite authors while you tell us, you know, what you're wrapping, you know, what you're doing for next. Um, do you want, who wants to start? Nina, you want to give us yeah, a, I'll idea start. what you're doing next? And Yeah, my next book, this is the first in a series called Menace Beauty. So this book is from the perspective mainly, it, it goes between the rabbi's daughter and the courtesan, and, and with the rabbi's daughter being first. The next book is called The Courtesan Secret, and it really focuses on the courtesan Belladonna, her a little bit, her background, and how she's threatened. And instead of Diana coming out of the ghetto, the courtesan goes in the ghetto to hide from her enemy. So she's hiding in plain sight. So that's the second of my books. And as far as my favorite authors, I mean, I have so many favorite authors that I, that I love, and most of them are writing historicals. Of the modern historicals, I really like James Ben, who writes, um, you know, uh, World War II, his uh, Billy Boyle series. I love his mm -hmm. series. I think that's fantastic. And um, some of the older series that I like, I like um, Ann Perry's series also, Victorian series, and now she's writing a new one, a thriller series that takes place also in World War II. Thank you, Nina. Lane, what are you doing next? I am working on book two in this series. It's called The Canvas, and I'm getting ready for the launch of Dead Men Don't Decorate. And I will just say that, yeah, I like a lot of authors, and, and, uh, and four of them are here today. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> and Mary, why don't you tell us what you're doing? Oh, thank you, Lane. Uh, I'm working on uh, the next one in the Intrepid Traveler series in which Stephanie goes to Venice and it is titled Death on the Grand Canal. And right now, um, a couple of my favorite authors besides these four, of course, are um, Ellen Byron and Alexia Gordon. I like Alexia Gordon's uh, Gethsemane Brown series. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are fun. And Connie, what are you doing next? Uh, book four in the series came out just this past May. Um, a novella will be coming out for the holidays in 2023. That will be book 4.5. And then in 2024, book five in the series. And I read almost all, um, I, if I'm choosing, British crime fiction. So I love Anthony Horowitz, uh, Ruth Ware, Ellie Griffiths, um, Charles Todd. Um, I'm I'm forgetting a whole bunch, but oh, um, Susan Hill. I love Susan Hill. Yeah. Great. Thanks. And for me, I'm also working on the next book in my series. It'll be book three. It's called, at least now, it's entitled Autumn Embers. Um, I'm also working on some short stories, interconnected um, Japanese short stories. And a standalone, I'm not really working on that. It's just sitting in the back burner, <laughs> wishing I was working on it. Um, but I'm also working on a mystery conference, uh, Murderous March. It's next March 10th and 11th. Mark your calendars. Um, Keep your eyes open. I'll send information around soon. Um, please look into our websites if you're interested. We have lots of information about upcoming events, uh, ways to sign up for our newsletters. Um, Nina was nice enough to put um, a PDF document somewhere in here, a little bit up there. It's a downloadable document that you can just click on and it'll download and has all our information on it. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to stay in touch. So please write to us if you have questions. Um, thank you for coming tonight. And thank you to Robert. Yeah. Yep. Thank, thank you, Tina. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Look for that email tomorrow. Everyone have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.